and you're going to get a little message there. And just let me double check that. Yep. Okay, we're good. Wonderful. So um, to start us off, I will apologize one more time for messing up time zones the last time we were scheduled to meet. I have never done that before and it, it didn't feel good. In any case, I know it was frustrating for everyone else as well. Okay, so what I've done is put together a presentation on the top 10 skills of superior client focused communication. And this is based on work with um, students in university and colleges um, and my clients that hire me to work on customer service based skills. So that's how I come up with this top 10. Now I did send out a link to a quick survey, two questions, and people did respond. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to find out a little bit more about, um, you know, what your relationship is with the phone, what you're hoping to learn. So the first question was, you know, in terms of phone communication skills, which of these would you like to learn more about? So 80% wanted to learn more about conversations that are unfocused and unproductive. And that was followed by 60% wanting to communicate with people who won't stop talking. I call that the constant talker and definitely have skills for that. And then tied at 40% are people who are very emotional. And in general, phone conversations are uncomfortable. That's not a surprise to me. Um, over the years, I would say, so I've been the phone lady for 17 years and maybe 10% of my work. Oh, Kate has arrived. So I'm gonna let her in and we'll let her get settled. Welcome, Kate. Good to have you here. We are recording and we've got started, but we're just at the very beginning. Um, so I was sharing that, you know, when I started the phone lady 17 years ago, about 10% of my work was related to phone anxiety, phone fear that kind of thing. And now it's about 40% of my work. So being uncomfortable on the phone, very, very common. And then we have difficult accents and background noise, as well as, you know, being uncomfortable when you don't know the answer to something that somebody is asking. So then I asked the question, if you had a magic wand and could change one thing about phone conversations, what would that be? So here are the responses, knowing all the answers. Um, how to politely end a conversation, knowing all the answers all the time, um, limit my own talking on the phone. So making sure I'm not the one that's the constant talker. So all of these things we are going to talk about in our hour together. The first thing I want to visit is why we have the phone in play anyway. Like why are we still doing phone conversations when we have email, when we have text, when we have Zoom, when we have all these other ways to communicate? Why does the phone still matter? Well, one of the things that we have to acknowledge about email and text is that it can be misinterpreted and misunderstood. And I'm pretty sure that all the people on the call with me in real time would agree that they have A, received emails or text they've misunderstood. <laughs> and they've also sent emails and texts that have been misunderstood. So it's so easy with words on a screen that are minus tone of voice for miscommunication to take place. And of course, email and texts can go unanswered. Um, 
the average, oh, Wendy's going to join us here. Um, welcome, Wendy, glad to have you here. Oh, she's just connecting to audio there. Welcome, Wendy, glad to have you here. Thanks for being here. Um, in a business context, individuals receive between 100 and 120 emails a day. So I'm that person. And, you know, things get buried. They go unanswered. They end up in spam. There's lots of reasons why an email doesn't go unanswered. And emails and texts can extend decision making. Decisions don't get made because we just go back and forth and back and forth. But more importantly, they limit our ability to build trust and relationships. So one thing for everybody to think about, the people that you trust the most, the people that you have the strongest relationships with, how often do you have real-time conversations with them? Um, when we have these relationships and we want to build them, we really need our, the sound of our voice to be part of doing that. So I'm not anti-email, I'm not anti-text, but they can't stand by themselves. We can't rely on them 100% of the time. Lada is entering, so I'm gonna let her in. And she's just connecting there to audio. Welcome, Lada. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Great to have you here. So we all wanna change our relationship you know, we want to put less faith in it. To me, email is the greatest seduction of our time. It's so easy when someone sends us our email to quickly respond by email. But really, we need to think about that a bit more. We want to really accept the power of the human voice and how it helps us communicate clear. And when we are reading an email or a text, when we're thinking about a client, for example, we can ask ourselves, well, what don't I know? So they've given me some information here on the screen about what don't I know? And um, it's important to um, then reach out and have a real-time conversation. In creating this and organizing this with Catherine, it was really important that we talk to each other. It wasn't a long conversation but it was enough for us to really get to know what the other person was gonna contribute and how they were gonna do it. Um, you know, when you proof an email, really think what could the other person misunderstand or misinterpret here? And is there value for the other person, for the client, for us to have this conversation in real time? When we write emails, we write them in texts. When we write them, we write them with a tone of voice in our head. So that voice in our head is talking while we're writing. And the tone of voice is clear to us. But when the other person receives these words on the screen, they read them with a tone of voice in their head. And that tone can be completely different than what we intended. And that's why that miscommunication occurs and why tone of voice in real time is so important. So what are the skills we want to look at? Well, no, again, there's information and the sound of the human voice. Your voice communicates your energy, passion, enthusiasm, trust, dedication to your work, all of that. And a client's voice communicates interest, maybe hesitation, maybe it tells you they have an unasked questions, question or questions. Maybe it lets you know they're curious and want to learn more. There's so much that their voice is going to tell you. When you're sending an email, you want to say, ask yourself some questions. You know, is this limiting my information gathering? Might I learn about more about this person or this situation if I actually spoke to them in real time? And am I really creating relationship by sending email? You know, is there value for the other person? to have a conversation in real time. And 
if an email, if you want to move from email to a real-time conversation, if you think that real-time conversation is going to be more effective, like a decision would be made or dates chosen, something would happen a lot faster if you moved to a real-time conversation. Reply to the email, but request the conversation. And also leave a voicemail because voicemail includes our voice. So it can really help nurture relationships and help the other person know a little bit about who we are. And when you're answering an email, if you ever stop and say, well, what do they mean by that? You know, what are they asking me here? Just pick up the phone. Because if you answer with that doubt, you have at least a 50% chance of being wrong. And that's gonna cause confusion and delays and all kinds of problems for you. So here's an action plan. If you are not using the phone because you experience that phone anxiety, that discomfort, start having more conversations with family and friends. You can let them know ahead of time. You can say, you know what? For the next three days, I'm gonna call everybody. I'm not gonna text or I'm not gonna email. I'm going to call you instead. So take my call because I really want to get comfortable with learning how to talk on the phone. Do stop hitting send automatically. Really think about the value of continuing the communication by email. Don't assume that send means received. I do a lot of workshops on this and I hear a lot of horror stories from accountants, lawyers, designers, everybody about assuming an email got received when it didn't. Really think about the impact of tone of voice. When you're having conversations with people, how does someone's tone of voice impact you? Even you know, if you're talking to your best friend or a family member, really pay attention to the impact tone of voice has on that conversation and uh, sort of think about how that translates to your career and um, your conversation with clients, with potential employers, all of those things. And simply suggest a phone or a video conversation more often. So that again, it's all about practice. If you're experiencing phone anxiety and discomfort, know that talking on the phone is similar to getting on stage and giving a speech. There's a lot of connections between the two things. So it's okay to be anxious. It's okay to be uncomfortable. But the way to uh, put that aside is to practice, just like everything else that we've been uncomfortable with in our lives in terms of skills. So I want to share with you a quote here. This quote, which I wish I'd said, is really the foundation of my work. And it's by Frances Hesselbein, just died in 2022. Uh, she was, I think, 108. But she was the uh, CEO of Girl Guides of America for a long time and uh, really a strong believer in leadership. She was presented with the um, Medal of Freedom by uh, President Clinton, I believe. And um, this is, you know, something that is so important to understand that communication is not saying something, communication is being heard. So when we're talking to someone, a friend, a client, a potential employer, what we have to think about is how can we communicate so they understand us? It's a huge responsibility. But we never want to have a conversation with someone in a business type setting and then say to ourselves, well, they didn't get it. You know, they didn't understand me. No, we really want to work at our communication skills so that we take responsibility for being heard by our audience. So now let's look at some of the skills based on how you answer that, that survey. And you know the biggest, the 80% was this idea of creating efficient and effective calls. How do we do that? 
How do we get on the phone, give the call the structure, and make it really effective? Well, turns out the human brain loves numbers, right? Numbers appeal to the logical side of our brain. And so they help with uh, quelling big emotions. So numbers are really important in a call when you're dealing with someone who's emotional. But also numbers work like the bouncing ball in karaoke. <laughs> so when we create um, numbers in a phone call, like an agenda, they will keep the other person moving forward and they will also help them make decisions. So how do we do this? How do we make this part of every phone call? Well, let's say that a client calls and immediately asks you three questions. Okay. So maybe what you can do is say, well, thanks for those three questions, Dennis. Let's go through them one by one and I'll provide you with the information. So now there's your structure. You're gonna go through three questions, one at a time. Your first question was, so then you ask that question. Now, Dennis, I hear it now, I hear. Um, Dennis knows there's three questions. So he's gonna answer your first question because he knows there's a two and a three, right? Now, let's say that based on his answer to one of your questions, he has another question or you realize you should ask another question. You can always add another question to your agenda by saying, you know, based on the information we just shared there, let's add a fourth question to our discussion or let's add another question to our discussion. But throughout, you're going to keep an agenda going. So when they answer number one, they know there's number two. When they answer number two, they know there's number three. When they answer number three, they know there's number four. So they're going to give you decisions in between. And when you finish number four, they know that's the end of the call. So it really creates great efficiency. But of course, sometimes clients don't call and ask three questions immediately. Sometimes they call and their thoughts are all over the place or they're emotional, they're distracted. You have to then take control and organize the call. So you might say, Debbie, I hear that we have three specific things that we want to talk about right now. The first one is, so again, you're creating that agenda. You've listened really carefully and you've pulled out three things that Debbie wants to talk about. Again, if she gives you an answer you can, that, that involves another item, you can always add another item, right? One other thing we can talk about today, Debbie, is. But if you keep those numbers, they will move through the numbers with you and there'll be an automatic ending to the call when you finish the numbers. Using the agenda with unnecessary chatter. So sometimes we do end up with calls where a person, the other person likes to share stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with what you do, with what you want to accomplish for them. So just let them talk for a while. You know, they say something, something about the flu or something, something about inflation. Just acknowledge it. Say, you could say challenging for sure. Now let's get to um, the, the details you need. So minimize your reaction so you don't extend the conversation with these off topic uh, contributions and immediately return to your agenda, right? Keep that conversation moving forward. And then at the end of each call, you want to be, give them a specific process. So I get a lot of questions about how do I end a call? What you want to know about the end of a phone call is your voice is automatically going to change. Um, for most of us, our voice gets a little lower and somewhat less energetic, not in a disconnect way, but we're moving on. There's the sound in our voice that we're going to move on to something else that we're doing. 
the summary tell also tells the person, this is the end of the call. I'm summarizing what we've done and this is the end of the call. So it can be, thanks for your call, David. Um, we've agreed I'll get more information for us on such and such and get back to you tomorrow. Look for me in your inbox tomorrow and don't hesitate to call if you have additional questions. So all of that sounds like the end of the call and your voice, your tone of voice will tell them it's the end of the call. So again, you are um, maintaining control over how that call is structured and how long it's going to take. So here's your action plan. You know, make use of an agenda, practice, on your outbound calls first, because you'll be able to prepare ahead of time. You may wanna jot some notes down and so on. And then once you've got that skill organized on outbound calls, it'll be easier to start practicing on inbound calls, listening really carefully, figuring out what the agenda is as the other person is speaking to you. And you will notice how much more efficient your calls are immediately. I'm going to stop there for a second and see if anyone that's on the call with me has any questions or comments at all about that. Okay, I'll keep going. But don't hesitate to put a comment in chat or raise your hand, whatever works best for you. So now we're going to visit the constant talker. And um, as the phone lady, I have the privilege of listening to other people's calls. It's a big part of what I do. I audit people's calls. And uh, one of my projects was in the insurance industry. So if we think about the insurance industry, we have a lot of big storms here uh, in Atlantic Canada. And um, you know, if a tree falls on somebody's roof, they have to call an insurance adjuster. And the insurance adjuster can really only ask them one question, which is, what happened? What's happened? Tell me what happened. So I was listening to this call and the gentleman um, said, well, I don't know where you were the day of the storm, but I was down the street. I was visiting my neighbor, Ted. Ted has this truck, beautiful red truck. I like to go up the street and borrow it from time to time. But on this particular day, he wouldn't let me borrow it because his wife, Lydia, now I think you know his wife, Lydia. She used to be the principal of the school. Your kids went to that school, didn't they? Mine did too, but I think they're about five years older than your kids. My kids are at such and such a university right now. One of them studying medicine, one of them. Anyway, you get the draft. The call was 45 minutes long. And I think the adjuster maybe spoke for three of those minutes. It was a really difficult call to listen to. It was exhausting. And I knew that as soon as the adjuster hung up on that call, their phone was gonna ring again. So it's really important that we have a way to work with the constant talk. The first step is that you want to use their name with no tone of voice. You simply want to say their name because human nature is when someone says our name, we'll stop talking. So for example, if Suzanne is my constant talker and she's telling me all kinds of things, I'm simply going to go Suzanne and she'll stop talking, but not for long. <laughs> this is a very small gap that you're gonna create in the conversation. And you wanna get into that gap and redirect Suzanne. So I'm gonna say, Suzanne, thanks for that information, Suzanne. Now, the next thing we wanna discuss is, I'm just gonna check chat here. <laughs> Suzanne's saying, sometimes, thank you. So I'm gonna say her name and then I'm gonna say, thanks for that information, Suzanne. Now, the next thing we need to discuss is, so I'm going to get in the little gap and I'm going to redirect her. And I may need to do this several times in the course of one conversation. Now, I'll share with you that this is a skill I get the most feedback on. Um, people will email me or phone me and say, you know, it was so hard to do this the first time. I was really nervous about trying it, but I did it. And I'm never looking back because it really, really works. 
So know that it's a bit nerve wracking to do the first time, but once you do it, you're gonna realize how much control it gives you over the constant talker. Now you have to end the call though. And that's tricky too, of course. And our uh, skill here has always been to say, I have to do something. Like I have to answer an incoming call. I have to go to a meeting and so on. But for the most part, the constant talker doesn't care about you. They care about what they want to talk about. So it works better most of the time if you can say, I want to let you get back to your day. So I'm going to end our call now. It's been great speaking to you, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I'm going to end our call here. Thanks for the great conversation. I'm ending our call now. So they don't experience that you've hung up on them and you've made it all about them, about letting them get back to their day, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's funny here is I'll get feedback on this too. And depending on the work people are doing, some of them have said to me, yeah, Mary Jane, we've tried that. And the other person says, I don't have anything else to do today. So if you're dealing with, an, for example, an elderly marketplace where people aren't necessarily busy and uh, they want to have a long conversation, it may not work, in which case you want to go back to, yeah, I'm really sorry, but I do have another line I have to answer. So here is your action plan here. As I've expressed, you want to practice, practice, practice. Um, it does work, but it is uncomfortable when you first do it. And then share with your colleagues that it worked and what that meant for you and the efficiency of your calls. Okay, now we're going to talk about working with big emotions. Um, I'm going to rely on you to put into chat if you've got a question or comment, because I'd rather answer it while we're on a topic. So if you have anything, please put it into chat. So there's a warning here. Big emotions are more common today than they were in 2019. It's a fact. Um, there's, you know, there's two reasons. So it's the pandemic, but also it's our relationship with large multinational companies. So if I was in the room with you, I'd be getting you to put your hand up if you shop at any large multinational store, like a, a Costco, a Walmart, a Target, any of those large companies. Um, what they know, they crunch the numbers and they know what it costs them to lose a customer versus getting a new one. So what they do is if you call and you're angry, they will give you something. And they've been doing this for the last 15 years. Um, so that has taught us as consumers to be a little bit more aggressive or a little angry at the beginning of a call when we call as a customer. And then on top of this, we have the pandemic that has made people a little less patient, I would say. And it's altered how they deal with their frustration. So we have to stay empathetic. We have to stay calm. Big emotions are never about us. They're always about the other person. So what are the steps we need to take? Well, again, none of the other person's reactions are about you. Um, they're really connected to the other person. The fact that they feel vulnerable for some reason, right? So you gotta set aside your ego, it's not about you. And you wanna ignite your compassion, okay? Now the big piece of information here is that when we are emotional, we cannot hear. <laughs> when we are emotional, it doesn't matter who we are, we can't hear. Our emotions are in a different part of our brain than our hearing. So think about the last time you had an emotional conversation, with someone you're close to when you were both emotional. And then think about which one of you was really listening to the other person. Neither one of you. 
So that's the challenge because when someone's emotional, we can't hear, we think we can resolve this quickly. So we interrupt them, but they're not able to hear what we're saying. So instead they experience being interrupted and that makes them more upset because they're wanting to share why they're upset. Okay, so it's really important to allow them to either finish what they have to say. And I mean, this applies to someone standing right in front of you as well. Um, finish what they have to say, or they start to slow down, or maybe they take a breath. You've got to wait for some sort of pause before you take the conversation back and start speaking. When you do start speaking, you want to use the magic words, which are, I'm sorry. Now I get a lot of pushback here with this. And over the years, I've just, you know, let it go. But um, two Christmases ago, I had a friend die in another city and it was posted on Facebook. And I was scrolling through the comments and I noticed that all the comments started with, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry does not mean you're at fault. I'm sorry means I'm listening. I'm with you. I want to be here for you. That's what I'm sorry means. And that's why it's the most powerful phrase we have available to us to start to diffuse an emotional caller. Use the magic words, I'm sorry without accepting responsibility for anything. So you can say, I'm sorry you're in this position. I'm sorry things are so difficult for you. I'm sorry this is happening to you, okay? And once you've said that, you wanna to move to asking them an open-ended question. Why? Because you wanna move them from their emotional brain to their logical brain. You want to get them thinking. If you can get them thinking, they, you will start to diffuse those emotions. You'll be able to communicate with them. So a popular question here, what do you think about my starting to share with you next best steps? Or what are you hoping will happen next? It's important to include the word hoping because you may not be able to deliver what they're gonna share there, but at least you're gonna get their expectations. But open-ended question, not close-ended, something they're gonna to have to think about. And that gets them into the logical side of their brain. Certainly, if a call becomes abusive, bad language, threatening, all, any of that stuff. And of course, check with a supervisor if you need to about their policy here. But you don't wanna stay on that call. If you stay on that call, it's going to impact all your other calls and probably anybody around you because you're going to have to vent as soon as you're finished. So if the behavior is really abusive or threatening, just say, know that I'm unable to continue this call if you're going to use that language. I do want to help, so please stop cursing at me or I'll have to hang up. So you do want to warn them in some way that if their behavior doesn't change, you're going to hang because if you hang up on them, again, that's a fuel on fire thing. Over the years, I've had many people tell me this. As soon as they did this, the other person changed their tune or they ended the call and the person did call back and apologize for letting their emotions get the best of them. So here's your action plan for big emotions. Pay attention when you're emotional, right? Practice. Practice everything. I'm going to say practice for every action plan and certainly confirm guidelines for handling uh, abusive and threatening calls. Now, talking on the phone is uncomfortable. I did want to address that because that came up. So why are phone calls uncomfortable? Well, you know, we actually started talking on our phones um, when the BlackBerry was popular. And that was the 1990s. So, you know, that's a long time ago. And in 2005, um, 
only 10% of households had a phone, a house phone. So for many, many, many of us, we don't automatically pick up the phone anymore. You know, I'm an old lady and uh, definitely a house phone on the kitchen wall with a long cord. But by the age of three, I was taught how to use a phone, how to answer a phone, how to take a message, all those things. And um, that's not the case anymore. Everybody has their own phone. So without a home phone, phone skills aren't transferred from to new generations, right? But also for older generations, phone skills may not be used anymore because there's no home phone. They also may be texting and emailing. And what this has brought to the surface is that talking on the phone is a skill. It's not an automatic. We don't get it at birth, the ability to talk on the phone. It's a skill, as I've mentioned earlier, much like getting up on stage and giving a speech. So you need to know what the skills are and then you need to um, practice them. And, you know, text, emails, Forbes and Zipia, which do a lot of um, uh, statistics, only 18% of emails are actually getting open based on, you know, 23 million texts, 3.2 billion emails. Wow. But on the other side, 82% of marketers agree that insights from calls reveal costly blind spots in what they're doing. Talking to people really helps. And that phone calls convert to revenue 10 to 15 times more than web leads or emails. And client retention, caller retention is 28% higher than when you try to solve a customer issue by uh, chat or by email. So all of this is really uh, important to acknowledge how valuable the phone call is. So what can you do to get over your discomfort? Well, first of all, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We've all heard that. Practice, practice, practice. Start with family and friends, uh, then move to doing a business transaction on the phone, something easy like ordering pizza or call a store to just find out what hours they're open. Maybe create a phone buddy in your workplace, help each other out, have someone listen to your calls and help you identify how you can improve. Um, if body language is vital, if you feel, oh my goodness, I can't talk to somebody without seeing them, um, but you still need to make phone calls. What a lot of my, um, the people I teach have done is cut two, two pictures out of a magazine, one of a smiling man and one of a smiling woman, and look at the pictures while you make phone calls. You won't have to do this forever. It's part of getting over that discomfort. And what I know to be true about phone calls and why I'm so uh, passionate about them is they do contain a superpower. The lack of body language actually amplifies our hearing. It's similar to being blind. So once you get comfortable with a phone call, you'll find that you're hearing things, whether it's a sigh or whether it's the quality of a silence, that actually helps you to really serve customers and create better conversations. It's a really amazing part of the power of a phone call. Now, unfamiliar accents came up in your survey as well. That, and you know, it's so common when we're on the phone and someone calls and we don't understand a word they're saying that's really can be stressful and hard. So I'll share here that I come from a very small gold mining town uh, in the far north. So I grew up with English and French and Italian, and that's it. And then I moved to Canada's largest city, Toronto. 
And when you live in Toronto, if you don't understand accents, you're not getting coffee. Like you really have to figure it out because it's so multicultural. You are, I am in the minority in that city, really. So I had to figure it out. And what I learned because of that is that accents are like music. It's just music you've never heard before. And you need to develop an ear for this new music. But you need time to do that. You know, we, we often put pressure on ourselves to understand an accent the first time we hear it. And it's not possible. Like if you've never spoken to someone from the Ukraine before or someone from Syria before, um, you're not going to understand their accent right away. So what you can do is you can ask them to help you. And I work with immigrants here and I work with international students here. So this is the phrase that we've created that helps both you and the other person relax and allows that allows you the time to develop an ear for the accent. So you simply say, I'm sorry, but I'm unfamiliar with your accent. Can you speak a little bit slower and repeat what you just said? So what they're hearing is not that you're saying, well, why are you talking with a funny accent? No, they're hearing that you want to communicate with them. You want to understand their accent and you're asking for their help. And the magic here is that, you know, once you understand one word, very soon after that, you're gonna understand the word on either side and the word on either side, etc. So you end up building a library of words and you really don't need a lot of words to be able to have a conversation. So, um, moving from Canada's biggest city to one of their Canada's smaller cities and working with international students and immigrants here, I suddenly realized that I can talk to anybody with an Asian accent and that's from living in Toronto and that I never understood every word, <laughs> but I understood enough to have the conversation and that is also going to happen but you have to allow yourself to relax in these conversations and learn the accent. And you will. Again, it's like listening to opera for the first time or listening to bluegrass for the first time. You're going to develop an appreciation for the accents. So here's an action plan. One of the other things that you can do is, you know, we have so much available to us online you can actually listen at your own pace to individuals with specific accents online if you want to do that. Um, you know, movies with subtitles, there's all kinds of ways that we can tap into a particular accent. And over time, you really are going to recognize and understand many of the words. It's, it's, it's not, it just happens. It's a pretty smooth transition when you're open to the listening and learning part. That's the challenge. And again, I'm bringing up practice. You can ask either clients or family, friends, um, other students with accents to help you, right? And they can do that by slowing down and repeating key phrases for you. Because again, you don't have to know every word in an accent. Now, background noise really does impact our conversations on the phone, whether somebody's um, in their car, or they've got lots of people talking around them, they're in a meeting, etc. So what you want to know about background noise is it's a distraction until somebody talks about it. Um, silly story here. I guess I, I must have been doing something for a friend. I was calling people at home. And I called a woman, she picked up the phone, and her television was up so loud in the background. There was no way we were going to have a conversation. So I happened to look at the time and I, and I said to her, are you watching Dr. Phil? And she said, yes. And I said, should I call back when it's over? She said, no, it's a repeat. And she turned it down. 
But if I had tried to have that conversation with that noise and not mention it, it would just, it wouldn't have happened. So you want to mention it. Um, if the noise is at your end, you can say, you know, letting you know that it's very busy here today and you may hear voices in the background, but you have my complete attention. And I think we got used to this during the pandemic when we said, kind of let you know, I have a dog here that barks, etc. But so it's that, just let the other person know the possibility of noise at your end. And if the noise is at their end, just say, sounds like, sounds like you have company today, sounds like you're driving your car. People will say, well, yeah, but I have you on Bluetooth or yeah, my kids are home from school today, but they're fine. And what you'll notice is the background noise just starts to diminish right away as soon as you talk about it. So again, pay attention to the noises around you and comment on them and um, you know, practice mentioning noises at the other end. And you brought up what to do when you don't have all the answers you know, that that can add to your discomfort on the phone. So no one has all the answers. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Nobody has all the answers. And we create exceptional service for our clients when we acknowledge that we don't know. It's not a weakness. Um, the, the customer, the client, it doesn't really expect you to know everything they're going to ask so the first thing to do is say that's a great question because it is at the moment i don't have the necessary information to answer it for you but i will find out that's it that's the key i will find out and you could say i will get back to you by the end of the day today or i'll get back to you by tomorrow or maybe if um you need to you could say either myself or one of my colleagues will get back to you but make the commitment that you're gonna find the answer and get back to them. And that is exceptional service right there, right? Um, you can be even more specific. You can say, that's a great question. I gotta do some research, but I'll get that done for us this morning and send you all the details in an email. So um, that's acceptable too. So you can say, well, I'm gonna to have to send you, do some research, gonna probably be Quite a bit of information so I'll, I'll respond to your question by email but I'll get that done today okay so not knowing the answer just leads to great customer service is the bottom line there you've really got to accept that no one at any company has all the answers there's always a question that can come up that you're going to have to think about or do some research on and it's okay to say I don't know, but I'll find out. And um, if for some reason the other person responds, what do you mean you don't know, which is rare, that's about them. That's about a deadline they might have or something. So yesterday my camera here went on the blitz and, uh, and it's, I guess it's eight years old. So it just stopped working. And um, you were my third webinar today. So I really needed a camera and I went to the store and they had cameras, but they would say to me, well, that's not in stock. Well, that's not in stock. And I was like, well, I need it now. <laughs> that was my vulnerability, right? There was like, I can't go without a camera reaction. And to bring us back to tone of voice, it really does matter every time our voice is a tool. It's a tool face-to-face, -to -face. it's a tool in a video call, um, but it's especially a tool on the phone and using it effectively is an art. So that ideal tone of voice, it's warm, it's welcoming, it's calm, it's patient. That's how you, you know, really display your commitment to each client. But it takes practice to have that voice available every time you talk on the phone. But know that when you do, you're going to decrease the number of people that are impatient or cranky with you. It's going to help with those really upset clients or those constant talkers. You know, you react to tone of voice too. So start paying attention to when you make an outbound call to your cell phone provider, your bank, whatever. 
how do you react when the other person sounds rushed or impatient or unfriendly? What tones of voice annoy you? What tones of voice inspire you? Uh, what tones of voice help you listen? These are all things that we can pay attention to that really influence our ability to communicate on the phone. So an action plan here, if possible, listen to recordings of your voice on the phone. People don't like when I say this. The reason you don't like it is that, you know, as I'm talking to you, I'm hearing my voice about an octave lower than it really is. The reason for that is that it's hitting several bones in my ear and my skull. So by the time it gets to me, it's been diluted for lack of a better word, and I'm hearing it at a lower level than you are. So then when I listen to my recorded voice, it's like, wow, I didn't know that's what I sounded like. I've been listening to my own voice for a long time on record. So, but you want to do this. You need to know what your tool is, what you're working on. You want to stay well hydrated because vocal cords need to be hydrated. Like if they dry out, you're going to have that cracking in your voice. To warm up your voice, if you're going to spend an hour on the phone or be on the phone a lot in a day, sing. Sing in the shower, sing in the car, um, sing, and it'll warm up your vocal cords. And this is an old fashioned trick, um, but it works. People can tell the difference between when you're smiling and when you're not. And you can be having a really difficult day, but if you speak to a client and you've got these muscles working for you, these smile muscles, it's going to change the sound of your voice. A couple of other quick tips, I see I'm almost out of time. Do make sure you use your name when you answer the phone. When we give our name to a caller, we are extending our hand. It's a handshake and we're creating relationship. So we do want to slow down a bit um, so that the customer really understands our name. I've been called Mary Jacobs and I've also been called Mary Jane Poppins. So I think that that's because I said my name too quickly. So there's an action plan there. And also you want to use their name and get it right. And of course, connected to accents, it can be a name you've never heard before. So what happens here is they say their name and we don't understand it. So we start to get stressed. Most of us will ask a second time. Sorry, I didn't catch that. We'll get even more stressed. We'll start raising our shoulders towards our ears, which compacts our oral canal and tightens our throat. And we kind of stop communicating right there. The other person, of course, recognizes this is happening. They can hear it happening and they'll start talking faster. So what you want to do is you want to say, I'm sorry, that's not a name I've heard before. Can you spell that for me? And then you want to take a chance at saying it. So you want to say, and is this the correct way to say it? And that completes that handshake you started when you gave them your name. The other thing too, is we can connect this back to upset callers. It's easy to be angry at a company. It's not as easy to be angry at Catherine. It's not as easy to be angry at Wendy, Suzanne or Lada, right? They're people. So it's really, really helpful there. So there's an action plan. Um, I've included this invitation to a free webinar I'm doing on confidence as a skill. Uh, I'm doing it with Mark Lerman, who is a coach for the U.S. Tennis Association. And uh, he's all about confidence as a skill. So um, because confidence and phone skills were part of what you mentioned, I want to share this with you. It's on May 3rd. It's free. And there's a link there if you want to attend. And then there's a bio about me if you want to know more about me or follow my blog or connect with me on LinkedIn. Be glad to have you there. So I'm going to stop sharing and with our last few moments, see what questions or comments there are. Tell me what you've taken away from today.
Mary Jane, thank you so much. I have to say I am probably guilty of not always saying my name because once somebody is programmed in my phone, I say their name. So it's just, it is that nice handshake. I like that idea. So um, when you become, I guess, my bad habits. Um, so I, I like that. I'm gonna, even, you know, for those I speak to once or twice a day, it's, it is nice. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Great. I appreciate all that you said. I, I uh, some of these, some of this advice really uh, helps as an instructor. I do get many students who have names that I do have a difficult time pronouncing, and I, it could take me a while before I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> so, um, but as far as some of those personalities and interactions, and I think uh, there has it, it has a lot to do with the, the age of the person. And I often say how how um, email has been the root of all evil in my life. Cause when I started teaching email didn't exist. <laughs> and so I, 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 I will uh, find some days that I will sit on email for three hours a day, answering emails. Yeah. Oh, it does lengthen the day. So a lot of what you're saying, I do very much relate to. So I appreciate some of your techniques. Thank you so much for, for doing that for us today. Well, well great. I have, I'll quickly share. I have a client whose first name is J A D E. Now I would pronounce that Jade. Mm -hmm. She pronounces it Jaddy. Yeah. And I struggled with that. Um, and eventually I thought of Chatty. So in brackets beside her name, I have rhymes with Chatty, Jaddy. Um, and that helped me finally get it right. Okay, well, thanks everybody. It's uh, because it's a one hour recording, it may take a little while before um, Zoom makes it available, but Catherine, I'll send it to you and you'll have seven days to uh, download it in the way that you want to store it to share with everybody else. Lovely. Thank you so much again for your time. Thanks. It was great to be here with everybody. Yes. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Thank you. Yeah, take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.